Praise the Lord. Sorry? I was going to do the gospel. Give the time to get ready. Oh, yeah. Did you want a chorus? Yes, we are super. Good afternoon, everybody. Because we're just taking up the uh, the top of the biscuit and bread, the uh, cups, and uh, welcome Pastor Simon, I must apologise, I thought you were going to be here later, if I'd known you were here now, I would have got you to do the talk, but next next week, and um, bring your sleeping bags, uh, and Pastor Simon will be giving the talk next week. <laughs> Great testimony, Sophie, you mentioned about your singing and your guitar playing apparently is very good and they do say that opposites attract so because um, we know that Simon can't do either so <laughs> um, welcome everybody and Anne for your testimony as we heard already from Greg mentioning the edification there good afternoon uh, welcome to uh, the revival meeting we've got um, a bit of time for a talk uh, an opportunity for people to be baptised uh, behind the curtain here is a baptism tank, it's nice warm water, there are changing rooms here for you to be baptised and to start a, a new way of life for you. I want to talk today about the simple heading called, We Reap What We Sow. If we can turn to Galatians in chapter 6, we reap what we sow. Galatians 6. Um, I'm no gardener, that's for sure, but um, I lived down at McLaren Flat for a number of years and they used to have the Almond Fest, or the Almond Blossom Fest, down, uh, down towards the south when there was a lot of almond trees. Some of the Flurio people might remember the Almond Festival and there was the Queen of uh, the, the, the festival would be crowned and they would do a lot of work around the community for that year. I don't know if anybody here has ever, some of our sisters that might live down that way, was ever crowned queen of the, uh, the uh, festival at all. Leone, you were. What year, Leone? <laughs> Let's give Leone a clap, yeah. What year was that, Leone? 76, wow. So we can get photos and we can show it next week, no problem at all. We can arrange that. <laughs> So a celebration of the almond festival and the blossoming of the, of the almond tree. Uh, there's a lot of vines now down there at this stage. You know, things are being pulled up. Um, I, li I worked down that way, lived down there in McLaren Flat when it did um, grape picking, cherry picking from trees, uh, um, plums. There's Roman Diagen plum that I learned about. Um, there was uh, different types of fruit trees, almond knocking, etc. And you kind of... That's what you did. You got paid cash. Um, I wasn't working. Uh, I grew marijuana plants, if you'd like to know. Well, there you go, my confession. <laughs> um, so there was one that called Martha, a very big plant. Just to let to share, share that with you. Um, other than that, I'm no real gardener, but we know what the Bible says about um, reaping and sowing. It's just the talk here today. So uh, in verse... 6 or 7 of chapter 6 be not deceived God is not mocked God um, doesn't like to be conned that's what is the word here mock he doesn't like to 
deal with pretense where people are pretending. So Paul writing here saying, look, don't play the game. God won't like that. Um, whatsoever man sows, whatever he puts in, whatever seed he applies to his life, and this is an attitudinal thing, a doing thing, whatever you do, uh, whatever thoughts you have that become an action in your life, um, he's saying here, that shall he also reap. That'll be uh, the, the gathering of your fruit, as we heard from the almond knock knocking in the different seasons that we have. He that sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. The word corruption there means uh, decay, uh, waste. It also means, metaphorically speaking, it's talking about sorrow and despair, unhappiness that you reap when you apply your life to the flesh. But he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Now the context of the Galatian, they were getting involved in the law, and Paul was trying to remind them, we've already heard from Greg here today, that the blood of Jesus Christ, his sacrifice, is the thing that's made us free and has given us our salvation. So we're now free because of that. And it was grace that acquired that nothing of our own we could do nothing of ourselves we were unable to uh, find ourselves in a position favorable with God in the things that we're doing in our own natural state so Galatians we took, it was a church moving back toward the law Paul wrote earlier on that he was, he was a bit astonished at how quickly and how suddenly they'd been removed from the grace and from the gospel that had been presented to them to another which was not another and he's quick to say here that the law, which sort of kept our flesh under control, was not going to be the way of salvation, but the Spirit, receiving the Holy Ghost, was going to be. So the context of this was, it was being liberated by the gospel message that we have here today, that we know to be true. And he says, therefore, there's a bit of a task involved to, to, to stay on that, um, not getting condemned, we heard already today, not feeling like we've got to earn our stripes, and the feeling of that I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy enough, I should do more, I don't pray enough, I don't read enough, um, I don't think about the Lord enough. Um, that world of I should, I should do this and I should do that is where the law would take us because we'd be required to do all sorts of sacrifices. And Paul was saying here that we're in, we're, we, we've been set free. We're now liberated. And we have a wonderful salvation because of that. But he also says in the next verse, let's not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. We're sowing to something unique. We're sowing something to the Spirit. Um, no, no other human being has ever seen that in their whole history of mankind. Other than the few... And when you look at the population of the world today, and when you look at the numbers of people that are receiving the Holy Ghost, even down through the age, it is a small number. The Lord said in Matthew that narrow is the way that leads to life. Few be there that find it. And broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many go thereat. When I first came to the Lord, I was at the top of the railway station in Adelaide, and um, I just within a couple of weeks and just saw people coming off the train up to work coming up the stairs and it just it just see you could see that people that the last thing that were on people's minds were the lord was the lord and i rang up the person that brought me to the lord and he quoted that scripture he said yeah you're right chris narrow is the way that leads to life and few be there that find it broad is the way that leads to everlasting life we've been given this unique ability to sow to apply our lives to something very spiritual and as a result of that we go against the grain of what the world tells us to do in by way of explaining itself in evolution in gender issues in all manner of things that are going on in our world today our understanding of what God requires mankind to do is completely different but we're sowing we're, we, we're talking to people about the Lord we're explaining things about how God works what he does how unique he is how special and how he can heal your body set you free 
and the wave, the tsunami coming back this way against what we're preaching. The Lord and Paul's saying, let's not be weary in well doing, for we will we we will reap if we just keep pushing forward. Let's go to Second Corinthians in chapter nine. Second Corinthians in chapter nine. Second verse six. Paul writing to the church at Corinth after they had been through some issues before. They fixed themselves up. They were walking on doing really well as a fellowship. And he said here in verse 6, But this I say, he which sows sparingly, which is just to hold back and to be stingy, the word, to abstain when you could have an opportunity that you don't, shall reap sparingly. He that sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Every man, according to the purpose of his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly of nece- or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Um, that was Paul's message to the church at Corinth when they had been not doing everything right. First Corinthians tells us how far bad they'd got in their understanding and being separate to uh, what God was intending that fellowship to head to in the, in the direction of where God was trying to lead them and they had uh, all sorts of crazy things going on particularly at the communion time that we've just had and he writes a really harsh letter to the church in Corinth to get themselves right and he was really sowing a seed to them at the time and they were sowing another seed a seed of uh, respect as a person's Whoever came into the room was treated differently depending on their social status. Um, There was banquets, people that had food, bought their food, those who didn't, couldn't. They weren't sharing their food. Um, There was immorality going on at the time. And Paul kind of, with bated breath, writes a letter to them and saying, you guys got this really wrong. This is really bad. He's sowing good things. He's sowing to the Spirit to teach the people at the time how to walk with the Lord. And then sends the letter off and prays the Lord that the church received that letter well and corrected themselves. And he tells them in the second Corinthians how you've, you've freed yourself of all the issues that you're dealing with before. But here he is in, in the second letter telling them the key is don't hold back don't stop keep going forward don't sow stingily but go forward and press on and and be bountiful the word bountiful there so and you'll reap beauty that's what it's talking about if you do it well then there'll be so many blessings in your life that you didn't even think possible at the time so here's paul writing that and if we go to Isaiah in chapter 5 just to see the difference between how, what the Lord provided and what Israel is now going back in the Old Testament of, of not kind of getting it right chapter 5 in verse 1 now I will sing unto my beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well beloved had a vineyard in a very fruitful hill, and he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest of vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein, and he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, and now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could I have done more to my vineyard that I had not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought forth wild grapes. And now go to, and I'll tell you what I'll do to my vineyard. I'll take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up and broken down, and the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. I'll lay it to waste, and it shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns, and I will command the clouds that they rain no more upon it. 
For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel at the time, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. He looked for judgment, behold, oppression and for righteousness, but behold, a cry. And he was, he is Jerusalem, the real nation of Jerusalem. This, this jewel in the crown of God's plan was uh, people at the time bringing oppression to the people. And he could hear the cries of the people uh, when he was setting it up, this beautiful uh, vineyard or this vine that he talks about. And you, you know, when you do your pruning, you do the grapes, you can, there's just a wonder when you're uh, pruning the grapes, or you, 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 you're taking the grapes off and clipping away there. There's just stacks of spiders. Um, and you're there all day clipping away, putting the grapes in boxes and then into the main uh, trailer. And it's going all over the world. It's going to be a produce. And then you prune all, uh, the, the grapevine later on. And there's just a real quality about working on, on a vineyard. And here was God saying, I did everything, everything for you, Israel, or Jerusalem, Judah, and you gave me nothing back. And this message that the Lord was using this illustration, this parable, is that, again, we, we sow, we're in the Lord, we, we plant our thoughts and our attitudes and our actions, and, and we expect in return there'll be a reaping, we'll receive something good. And the Lord was saying here, you weren't looking to me, you didn't value me as your, as your leader. That was Israel at the time. Right through the ages, God has used nature to illustrate how we can walk with God. There's a verse in the Bible in James that says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth. Husbandman is one dealing with the vineyard, waits for the precious fruit of the earth, and has long patience for it until he received the earth and the latter rain. So there's a whole process of waiting for that grape to appear. It requires good soil, uh, the sun, and rain to come at the right times. And here was God saying as the creator of heaven and earth, I did everything for you, Israel, and yet you found it hard to come back and give praise and glory to, to, to me, the one who provided it all. Let's go to... Galatians in chapter 5. Back to Galatians. Galatians 5. Verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit, this tree of life, this tree that we have, has been given to us by the Lord, has been planted into our heart, and we'll receive the Holy Spirit, and it grows in our life, becomes a tree. And the fruit of that tree, the fruit of the Spirit, is love, is joy, is peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Back in the Old Testament, in some days, it was reported to be 20,000 sacrifices in one day. In one day. All throughout the history of Israel, there was a sacrifice of animals unto the Lord. And it required all sorts of different times and seasons that they would do that. And here, the Lord is saying, when you receive the Holy Ghost, there's no limitation. There's no law against it. There's no law that brings it down to a place and a time. But the, the Lord has given this spirit, this fruit that we can teach others. And the fruit replenishes itself. We can give out love. And people can receive that love and grow it in their own heart and move them toward the things of God. We can bring out joy and happiness and peace that the Lord wants us to share around the world that we live in today. It's the fruit, it's the tree that we are. So we're this beaming tree now, uh, whereas once we were barren, uh, lost in a darkened world that we lived in, and now we've been liberated by what the Lord has done in our life. This, this tree that we have, this special tree that it's in our souls, in our heart, we feed from the water of life, straight from the kingdom of God. Our soil 
has been changed. We'll look at it in a verse in Hosea a little bit long, later on today. Our whole internal structure of our heart has been completely and utterly changed to where it was before. We could not have been able to produce or sow love or, or happiness in any of our abilities before, no matter how great a person is today in this room, no matter how rich you were and how spectacularly behaved you were, no matter how well you were brought up, it was impossible for you to sow to the Spirit the way that is written in Galatians, but now we can, but we can also sow to the flesh. That's what the world that we live in prior to receiving the Holy Ghost, we could only sow to one thing, it was the flesh. And the Lord was using people to bring us the truth, so that eventually it got through to our heart and our mind and our soul and we listened and we were baptised and filled with the Holy Ghost and now we have this new heart, this hardened heart that was taken away from us has now been a place whereby we have the ability to produce good soil and without good soil, without good nutrients in the soil, without the right measure of the sun and the seasons and the rain, we have no, no produce at all. We know what that's like many years ago when... Australia was going through a drought. It got to a point where uh, the Prime Minister at the time was uh, John Howard. I remember him telling on TV in one of the interviews, he said, we're at the point now where, I think his words were, we're at the point now where Australians need to start praying because the drought was so, so bad in Australia at the time. And we did. Because a little bit later on after that, it started to rain. And our, all our, our farmers and everybody was happy. And Australia just relies so much on our agriculture, horticulture, that we know what it's like to, to um, you know, have a drought. And we know what it's like to have, uh, you know, food in abundance. We got, um, we'll just quickly go to Psalm 1, Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1. Yeah, I remember thinking at the time, well, that's pretty brave of John Howard at the time, but it seemed to work. Just in line with this fruit tree that we have, he tells us here in verse 1, the start of the Psalms. Blessed is, verse 1, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinner, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. To be scornful, it tells us, is to be cynical, to, be, um, to have a feeling of uh, insulting behaviour, to ridicule, to um, be negative, to be suspicious. This word scornful to laugh and deride at people who are trying to do the right thing. And the psalmist is writing here that we don't sit in those seats anymore that we may have once did and maybe we were once one of. A scornful person, a person who was conceited and um, just mocked at everything at the good or possible part that was well and right. And didn't believe in a good story, didn't believe in a good outcome. Thought it was impossible that there could, there could be a, a, a true God that would kind of work in a person's life. And the psalmist says here, we don't sit with those people anymore. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and the Lord does meditate day and night. And when we do that, it says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf shall also not wither, and whatsoever he doth, he shall prosper because we've been planted in God's garden. If we go to Proverbs chapter 11, this is where, who we are now. We couldn't do this before. Proverbs chapter 11. Where are we? Just one verse. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Through that tree that we have of love, joy, peace, goodness, gentleness, faith, meekness, temperance against such reason, those very fruits 
are the things that bring people to the Lord, that, bring, that brought us to the Lord. And we've been planted by this beautiful river where the, the source of that water is from heaven itself. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. You know, this water of coming from heaven, from the very kingdom of God itself, flows in our, in our heart and soul today. And the uh, soil that we've got, he's just done a complete makeover of that hardened, barren soil that lacks so much, so much spiritual significance in the way of nutrients. It lacked the ability to help in the way that God foresaw that we could do. And we're separate from the world now because of that. We've been separated. We heard a gift today that... I've chosen you. And we have a, a quarantine now. If you look in Australia, particularly South Australia, um, when you drive into state and come back in, you have to get rid of all your fruit and your vegetables uh, because it might infest and damage some of our produce that we have in the state. In fact, it's just reasons it only takes one piece of infested food, fruit to cause devastation to the state's horticulture industries and communities. And they provide disposable bins. For Australia was, um, you know, as we didn't have our quarantines in place, we had um, seeds that came in from all over the world. Uh, Patterson's Curse, uh, that, you know, that purple flower. We had um, blackberry. We get fruit fly at the moment. The state's fruit fly free, and uh, because they've got this quarantine process in place, uh, tumbleweed that causes great problems in the in the um, farming industries in America. Morning glory, these really wild plants that just eat up of everything that's good of our of the local um, plantation, and. A lot of these seeds came from the fleece of sheep being brought into the countries at the time. And um, it's just sort of thinking about that is that we're sheep and we've got to make sure that we haven't got um, scornful seed, seeds of doubt, cynicism, critical seeds that kind of get brought up, caught up in our fleece uh, because we've been separated from the world and we... We don't think the way that the world thinks anymore, and we're very happy to, to do that. Our quarantine process is today. We have a communion time. Our uh, quarantine abilities to make sure that we're producing and that we're not going to harm a whole industry of uh, other trees in a, in, a, in a paddock, wherever it might be. We, we have a, a fruit in our life and we don't want to be uh, producing weeds in our heart and soul that can contaminate ourself first and then contaminate uh, the people around us because we have uh, this beautiful seed now this wonderful seed given to us by God and, and he says look you can, do, you can sow to the flesh and that is like a, a Patterson's curse that you can see bad for the uh, for the uh, livestock, horses particularly, they, uh, and um, Mount Lofty uh, Landscape Board. I think Pastor Chaz would remember how he, when he was working how much time was spent eradicating, particularly the Patterson's Curse one. I remember that's just used to be all over the hills now, it's almost gone. Because they put a determination to eradicate it out. And Paul, in writing to the church at Corinth, so you've got some tumbleweed in your, in your midst. You've got some uh, morning glory. You've got some tumbleweeds that roll out and, and, and kill the livestock in, in time, but it definitely kills your produce and your communities because they lose money from not being able to get the produce, the value to the dollar. And it contaminates people around. So Paul wrote that, and they collectively, collectively got together and kind of repented and brought forth great fellowship and, and the revival grew in a really big way, a massive way. 
And Paul, Peter writes that we're being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abideth forever. The seed that we have now is perfect. It's not corruptible. It's incorruptible. It's in our souls. Therefore, the soil that we've got, the pure crystal clear water that we have is in us for good reason to be able to bring people along to the things of the Lord. In Deuteronomy, it says not to mix seeds together. Thou shalt not sow thy seed uh, with vineyards with diverse seeds, lest the fruit of it, the seed which thou hast sown, and the fruit of the vineyard be defiled. In Leviticus it says, Thou shalt not um, uh, change the gender of cattle with diverse um, kind, but thou shalt not, and thou shalt not sow the field with mingled seed. So in every aspect of what God wrote, he spoke about this purity of the nation. And when they came in to the promised land, he made sure that the produce first went to God and God was given the glory. We heard a little bit there was um, uh, Greg mentioning about the Passover. And 50 days after the Passover was what was called the Feast of, 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 uh, of Weeks, where what we call the day of Pentecost, Pentecost. And if we can go to Acts chapter 2, part of the agriculture of Israel, and right at the beginning of the Passover, 50 days later, they had a ceremony. They had um, the Feast of Weeks. It was an expression of gratitude. We're going to Acts chapter 2. It was uh, an offering that you weren't allowed to partake of. They would make loaves from the wheat. That, that was first, the first produce of that month or that, that season. And no one was be able to take of any of the fruit of the grape or any of the different whatever that was going on at the season at the time until that was offered up to the Lord first. Then Israel could partake of that produce. But the first thing they did, Passover, 50 days later, the Feast of Weeks of what changed to the Feast of Pentecost was the first fruits of that year. And it was not mingled with other seeds. It was not from another nation. It was Israel's seed planted by Israel's people and they relied upon the Lord God, their God, to provide the weather and the seasons for them to grow their, prop, their crops. And when it came to that time of reaping, they would give it first to the Lord as a gratitude of thankfulness, of a thank you, Lord, of a reminder that God had taken them out of a, another period of time in their history when they were... Uh, laborers and prisoners to another country they were subject to slaves and they, were be, they had been delivered from that Passover Jesus died on the cross as the Passover lamb we can read about that in Corinthians and he was that Passover he sacrificed his blood for the whole world not just for Israel for the whole world he sacrificed his life so that you and I could live forever and 50 days later right on cue ordained of God planned of God was the day of Pentecost we read here in verse 1 when the day of Pentecost 50 days after Jesus has died was fully come this word fully means a lot of preparation had gone into this day in the war when they had D-Day when that day was fully come, it says in history books, millions and millions of dollars, several nations all over the world getting together to defeat, defeat at the time an enemy. A lot of effort and planning, inventing of, uh, of machinery that hadn't existed at the time, of how they would get this ability to deliver and free up Europe at the, in that, back in 19. 44 in the in the uh, June the 6th 1944 D-Day landing when it was fully come there had been a lot of preparation 
when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon and that day arrived in July 16th or 19th, whenever it was, when he landed on the moon, President Kennedy, back in 1961, said he wanted some, it would be good if someone would land on the moon by the end of that decade. With five months to spare, uh, the Americans did it. And they landed on the moon, or did they? Oh, there's a bit of suspicion. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Um, I think we, we can rely on that you can say he pretty well did. So Neil Armstrong lands on the moon. One small step for mankind, one giant leap for man, uh, whatever it was, mankind, for man. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. When that day was fully come, there had been a lot of effort gone into ensuring, and there's one or two people that lost their lives along the way for this particular day. So when the Lord talks about when this day was fully come, this was like no other day in the history of mankind. Was it, they were all in one place, in one accord, one place. There was no seat warmers. There was no lukewarmers. There was no people not too sure. There was 120 dedicated people waiting for the Holy Ghost. For 50 days now, they've been waiting Jesus said, wait in Jerusalem, wait. Well, that's 50 days of waiting and praying for this day, where mankind, a day that would never ever be like any other. This is the birth of the church. When the children of Israel moved out of the Exodus and they went into the wilderness. They went up into the mountain in there in Mount Sinai to see and hear God. And they talk about, we heard the voice of God. We heard the voice of God and trembled. And the mountain shook and quaked. So when they kind of met God for the first time after being captive for 400 odd years, Abraham was told that there would be a time when Israel would be in another place for 400 years and the Lord would deliver them, visit the people and deliver them. And they were delivered. They're at Mount Sinai in the middle of the desert and there they can hear the voice of God. On Passover, this is a unique moment in the history of man and for people there. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting when uh, Mary, this word filled all the house where they were sitting, it's in the same word that's used, filled. When Mary was filled to overflowing, when she was the one chosen to carry Jesus Christ in her womb, she said, blessed am I above all women. I'm filled to joy. So this filled is filled, all in consuming. And there appeared unto them clothing tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with tongues, other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and confounded because they had every man them speak in, in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? The Galileans were a dumb people. They weren't intelligent. You know, they were treated as pretty basic people. We have suburbs where we jokingly call them bogans. Well, I'm not going to say anywhere in states. We make a bit of a joke about different states that we live in. You know, the rednecks. I won't say where they're from, but <laughs> just that's Australia. And... We have a bit of a light humour about that. Galileans were treated pretty bad. They weren't supposed to be educated people. At one point there, they perceived that they were all Galileans, a bit, a bit slow. So these wise men, these incredibly gifted men, were saying, how come this is happening in the Galileans? Now, we went to India once, and there was a brother... Um, in, in his language in, in, in Tamil the word I kept thinking of his word stutra so I said to the guy at the end what does stutra mean if you're hearing that it means praise the Lord in Tamil oh, okay 
come back to Adelaide and then one of the gifts at the Vogue I, I actually opened my eyes I heard the little stotrum 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 I, opened my, I know that word so it's the tongues of men and of angels and it says here how we every man born Parthians, the Medes, Elamites, Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontius, and Asia. This is the whole world. This is Arabia, this is Egypt, Libya, Cyrene, Rome, around the whole world, people where they lived were hearing this, had come to hear this amazing event. This is the moment where God brought salvation to mankind. This is the moment where God has said, This is eternity, this is eternal life. This is the moment, the birth of the church. The church was born on this day where people were received the Holy Ghost and then he preached after them, Peter, if we look in verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts the message from Peter and, and to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Your life's going to change. You're going to be able to sow and reap spiritual things in your life. I'm going to give you a pure seed. Like when Israel moved into the, into the promised land, they eradicated themselves of all the, the, the bad seed, if you like. Like we have is when we were filled with the Holy Ghost the Lord got rid of the bad seeds that were in our life the things that did not produce anything good we've been quarantined from this world now by the power of the Holy Ghost we now are able to produce good soil good water good sun good rain we want to be part of a latter day revival this is the birth of the church people receiving the Holy Ghost and the Lord is saying to us we got a task in front of us it's a big task to tell people that they've got to change their the heart of flesh that they've got to a heart of spirit and it's against the grain of the world but Paul writes don't be weary in well doing today is your day of salvation if you want to be baptized healed set free blessed touched in your life where you want to start again where you want to get rid of that rotten old heart of yours the crusty old thing that you've got with a fresh beautiful freed up pardoned set free heart this is your day we're going to have a prayer line now come out to the prayer line come to the get baptized here today the seed that you have in your life today if you're not filled with the holy ghost is corrupted it can't bring you into eternal life it can't change the soil that is in your heart it can't change your mind but the spirit will do that for you it will change every aspect of your life and you'll be separated and you'll have this tree of life where you'll be able to love for the first time and show joy and peace and happiness for the first time in your life no matter what age you're at this is the day of salvation your day has fully come come and be baptized today and all the people said let's leave it there